Well, hey there, everyone. We're back in the vegetable garden. It is so crazy to me that we find ourselves here at getting close to the end of the growing season when it feels like it was just not long ago at all that we were planting up this herb bed. And I was sharing with you some of the sort of creative ways I was planting up my beds this year, um, just to make them more beautiful in terms of design and, and to uh, play around a little bit. Because the whole point of that was that, especially when you're growing in raised beds, um, the world's your oyster. You can plant in designs, you can do whatever you want. You can have fun with it. So this is a series that I've been working on with Jung Seed and I will link the first two videos. The first one was planning for this and planting way back when we planted seeds for all these things in like March or April, whenever it was. Um, and then we actually planted it in the ground and here we are at the end of the season and I wanted to show you what it looks like. Now, probably should have done a mid-season update because to be perfectly honest, especially in the herb bed, things were looking a little better mid-season. We've had a few issues. Who doesn't have issues in their garden? So I'm gonna show you it anyway, um, because I think this is common things that we deal with in our gardens. So yeah. if you can remember back to spring, we were planting up this herb bed. I planted uh, this basically in diamonds using uh, vari three varieties of basil. And then I filled in the corners with other herbs like thyme and dill and parsley. I put some nasturtiums in here, um, rosemary. And it's been a pretty good year, but like most people, uh, this year, I had some real weather challenges. I know that everybody's been affected by really unusual weather this year. So I'm not alone in that. And in fact, what was wrong for me is pretty minor compared to some of the major issues that people dealt with weather-wise. Um, but a lot of those challenges are reflected in the garden this year. So two problems in particular with the basil. One, we had a really bad year for Japanese beetles. It's the worst year that I can remember for Japanese beetles. Um, Normally, I would say they're mostly for us, mostly bothersome. They do damage some plants. Rarely do I have a situation where they do major damage, which did happen with the basil crop, because that is one of the things uh, that Japanese beetles like. They like a whole bunch of things, and basil is one of them. So they really got the whole, the whole lease situation was really bad. They really ate up the basil pretty bad. And then I also dealt with basil downy mildew. It's only maybe the second or third time I've ever had that happen in my garden. It's not something I've dealt with for many years. Um, undoubtedly, that is absolutely weather related here. We had, um, as I've mentioned in many other videos, I guess I'm explaining a lot of the issues that you're seeing this year, but we had a very dry summer uh, and then we had very high heat and very high humidity. So even though these uh, beds were on drip, I don't think they were getting quite enough water. Um, so things were a little stressed uh, and then the Japanese beetles came so they were a little more stressed and then we had this high humidity and especially because I planted things really closely because I wasn't worried about it because it hasn't happened for a long time uh, there was not a lot of airflow here and that's just a recipe for basil downy mildew. So you can see that I, I had to ended up pulling out like entire plants or chunks of basil plants but it stopped once I got those out of there that were affected it hasn't shown up again but the basil is not looking great at this point um, so the ways that you can deal with basil downy mildew if this is something that affects you in your garden regularly is first of all plant resistant varieties there are some varieties out there that are specifically bred um, much of that breeding has been done at Rutgers University they're specifically bred to be resistant to basil downy mildew. Now, the main variety that I planted, which was this um, Everleaf Emerald Towers basil, um, is not one of those that has been bred to be resistant, but because it grows very tall, it tends to have a lot more airflow than other basil, basils that sort of grow more like a bush. This Everleaf Emerald Towers grows very much as a tower. So, uh, that might be one of the reasons I've not had issues because I've been growing that variety for a couple of years now. I also only had issues with it after I harvested about half of it. I basically went through the entire basil patch and harvested, cut down about the basil down to about half and harvested all that to use. Um, and that, after that's when I started getting the um, downy mildew issues. And that might be because there just wasn't a lot of airflow because now the plants were shorter and kind of um, all the plants were the same height. There was not a lot of airflow on top, just a theory. But let's talk about some of the successes here. I think you can see that the whole pattern idea really worked. 
I don't think anyone's going to say I didn't maximize the space in this raised bed because it was packed. And even though we had issues with some of the produce coming out of it, um, I still got more than I could have possibly used at the time. Um, the parsley did great. I, I planted less parsley this year, but cut on it more frequently, which has really kept it going. Um, all the other herbs have been really great. The dill went to seed pretty quickly. That's pretty typical with dill. Um, I expect that, and I like the flowers on it, and I, and I often grow that for the swallowtail caterpillars, who I've seen none of this year, by the way, unfortunately. Um, the Crimson King basil that I grew, the purple basil, really got hit very hard by the Japanese beetles. Um, and then it got stressed and what happened was, I mean, I think what I learned with this is that this purple basil, you really need to pick that very frequently if you want that purple color to stay because the leaves do sort of, uh, turn kind of green olive color, um, as they get older. So I think that is a basil, you know, conceptually, I liked it for the artistry factor of planting this in terms of practicality. It's probably one that you should plant and then plant on. Um, cutting on that frequently, you'll get more basil, you'll get those nice purple leaves that we're all looking for because we're growing that variety because it's pretty and also because it tastes good. So when I planted this herb bed, I said I was leaving the end of the bed for the cucumbers. And uh, even though they look a little bit disreputable now because we're at the end of the season, what a fabulous cucumber year I had. Really, in fact, the only issue with it is that um, the vines grew so well that I had, I was hard to find the cucumbers in there. And just like the zucchini thing, I would sometimes come back to the bed and find an enormous, not good cucumber. Cause there's really nothing you can do with a giant cucumber. I don't think you can do stuff with giant zucchinis, like make delicious zucchini bread, but a giant cucumber is pretty much shot. Anyway, that was the only complaint I had a great cucumber year, um, which is crazy. The only thing I would say is that I uh, had some issues with the drip system this year. I ended up having to replace most of the quarter inch lines that ran through the beds because I found out that only the plants closest to the end were getting water and that happens to be the where the cucumbers were. So I think in this bed, the cucumbers were getting enough water to be happy. The herbs were not getting much water. And in some cases, I don't think they were getting any water until I figured some of this out. So it's always a learning experience, right? I did just want to show you two of those basils that are doing really well. I always stick a couple in this box right by the back door. This is for quick cooking. If I just need a little something um, for on top of a dish, I can run right out here. And uh, this is where we've been eating from most of the time because this isn't where I would make pesto or something from. This is just for every day adding to food. And these are both doing really well. And in fact, these have been regularly cut on. So they're actually doing really well, getting quite bushy. Recently, I've been taking a lot off of this because we've been eating a lot of tomato salads. So um, it's a little short, but it just keeps getting new growth and we haven't run out of it yet for that purpose. Now this bed is showing a big difference. I showed you this bed just to show you that in this bed, I was planting everything on the diagonal, which uh, worked out great. Boy, I had amazing bean harvest this year. Blue Lake beans, I don't think you can go wrong with them. They're a classic for a reason. I'm still picking beans out of here. They have been delicious. But I think what we need to talk about is this. This is where I planted turmeric and, um, and this is ginger. And we are not ready to harvest this yet. We'll see what we get. It's the first time for me growing these in raised beds. I have grown them in containers before. Uh, but it's been really fun. Here's what I would say about the turmeric. Uh, look at how beautiful these leaves look. These leaves look, it's very similar to a canna, but if you've ever grown cannas and you deal with Japanese beetles, you know that cannas are major targets for Japanese beetles and they can really make a mess of them. They didn't touch this turmeric, which is, you know, three feet away from the basil that they annihilated. So, I would say if you're looking for that tropical look in your garden, uh, maybe think about putting some turmeric in your garden and you can harvest it later if you want, but just think about growing it as an ornamental because it definitely gets you that can of look without the issues that you deal with with Japanese beetles. Now I didn't get flowers on any of these things and I don't expect to get flowers on any of these things. Hi. Anyway, that's the little tip about that. but. The diagonal planting I thought was really interesting in this garden because it kind of drew you back here from the other side of the garden. 
So I did just want to show you this area. This is the garden that I had planted the garlic in. And so I harvested that at the end, end of July. So I planted some fall crops in here. And in this garden, I just did um, squares. So I did however many, I mean, it's almost like a square foot garden theory. Although I've really packed these plants in here because these are all fall plants. They're not, you know, I'm going to be harvesting these before they get enormous, but I've got um, Swiss chard and beets and cabbage in here and maybe some Brussels sprouts um, and some kale in here. So I've really packed this in, but I planted everything uh, in squares. So it's kind of a sort of a checkerboard pattern kind of thing, but it's just one more thing. I mean, I just find it more interesting to plant in something other than a straight line. So I did just want to show you one other basil that I grew this year. And this is the sister to the Everleaf Emerald Towers um, that I grew in the other garden and uh, over by the back door. This is uh, new this year or maybe next year. And this is Everleaf Thai Tower. So this is a Thai basil and uh, it's beautiful. Look how tall it got. I mean, that's easily two feet, maybe more than two feet. Delicious, um, has just stayed really healthy, um, really beautiful here at the end of this row. So if you like a Thai basil, that might be one you might want to look for next year because it really is delicious and beautiful. Nice, shiny, clean leaves on it. So you guys remember in that video where I showed you that I was planting all this kale really close together? Well, it's worked out great, you can tell. I, we've been eating on this all year. There are some leaves that are a bit bit up by um, cabbage worms and things like that. I didn't do anything to really protect from cabbage worms or anything this year. I just squished them when I saw them, but I didn't spray anything at all this year. In fact, I don't know that I ever have in this garden. Um, but you can see that there's a Swiss, one of the Swiss chard that I planted that was a tiny little seedling. All of the original lettuce that I planted around this, we ate all that and of course that went to seed. And then I planted another round of lettuce, um, which is still okay here. A, few, a little bit of it's going to seed, but still tastes great. Um, the ones that haven't gone to seed yet. And uh, we're still picking leaves off this gorgeous kale. And once again, uh, it's a good thing I like the taste of this kale because I really love the look of it. So I have no problem sticking this. Uh, this is Black Magic uh, Dinosaur Kale. I love it. And in fact, it, in a lot of places, it's not too late to plant this. Uh, kale actually gets better after a frost. It's super cold hardy. Um, you could probably still plant some seeds of this now, especially if you have a way to give a little bit of protection, then you'll really extend that season way into, you know, even winter um, in some places. So this was totally a success. And uh, it's really interesting. This is one of the first, this is the first bed when you walk into the garden and people absolutely gravitate here immediately, even though there's all this beautiful stuff beyond it. All right, so that's the end of the season update on how all my creative planting designs worked out. You know, I like to plant things in my raised beds in just a different way to kind of change it up and have some fun with it. The exceptions to that are my tomatoes, which I plant in straight rows because I like to use the uh, Florida weave method of holding them up and the squash, which are just going to kind of go everywhere no matter what you do with them. Although I did plant lots of nasturtiums amongst the squash this year. I had, knock on wood, not a single squash bug. I never saw a cucumber beetle on my cucumbers. I did see some on my dahlias. Uh, so, I mean, I think that all worked out great. So I'd really love to hear from you if you did any sort of creative planting designs in your garden this year uh, and what those were and how you liked them because I think it's super fun. I've been really happy with it. And if you tried it, I hope you were too. So just a big thank you to Junk Seed for partnering with me on this series. It's been a lot of fun to do, and I love working with Junk Seed. They are a family-owned seed company that's been in business for a very long time right here in Wisconsin. They have amazing products. They know what they're doing. Um, they sell good seeds and good plants. Um, most of the seeds that you see in my garden came from them this year, but I was their customer long before I worked with them. Uh, so I always love to partner with companies like that. So thanks again, Junk Seed. Let me know how your gardens went this year. I can't believe we're doing wrap up videos in the vegetable garden already. Although clearly there's a lot left to eat in this vegetable garden and hopefully in yours too. All right, thanks for watching and we'll see you soon. Have a great day in your garden.